When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. This is our weekly hour devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to people of African descent and others fighting for to build a better society. Today, we are joined by a regular guest here on the Black Star Network uh, who appears frequently on the Horn Report uh, with Brother Faraji and the culture, but who appears everywhere. Um, he is prolific scholar, author, activist, fighter for social justice, geopolitical commentator, the host of his own show, Freedom Now, on uh, the Pacifica Network, and the author of several dozen books. The last time he was with us, he we discussed his latest book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, and it seemed very appropriate in this moment when the United States of America seems to be caught up in border wars and states' rights exercises in the form of sending human beings from one state to the other as if there is some political stunt or gain that can be made. We'll invite him into this conversation around uh, what's going on in Florida, what's going on in Texas as it relates to the actions of Governors DeSantis and Abbott, and help us really understand what's going on, both in, in a national and an international context. So without any further ado, we invite back to the Black Table our friend and brother and comrade, Gerald Horn. Welcome back, Brother Gerald. Thank you for inviting me. Always, always, brother. Um, you know, maybe we can start with your take on these current uh, actions by Ron DeSantis in Florida and Greg Abbott in Texas with regard to shipping folks who have come to these borders uh, to places they would like to pretend have different political interests. And maybe you could tell us maybe to a couple of things. Where are these folks coming from to come to the United States? And what do you think these two governors and others uh, like Ducey in Arizona, among others, are trying to accomplish with these these political stunts? Well, the short answer is that the migrants are disproportionately coming from Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba, which coincidentally be happen to be the three regimes in the hemisphere, which the United States is putting pressure on as the Kissinger Nixon regime said some decades ago, they're trying to make the economy scream. And instead they're helping to induce movements into the United States. What they're trying to accomplish? Well, obviously uh, Governor DeSantis of Florida and Governor Abbott of Texas would like to be the next US president. As they see it, uh, this kind of issue using migrants as props and stunts for these political escapades uh, resonate with their base. As I understand it, uh, Governor DeSantis actually sent his emissaries into Texas to inveigle migrants to head to Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Perhaps he felt that if he sent folks directly from his own state of Florida, that that would not play well with the Cuban American base, the Venezuelan American base, the Nicaraguan American base, which I'm afraid to say are an essential component of the Republican Party base in the state of Florida. I think there's also a kind of demagogic class question at play. Hmm. If you look at the Republican Party base, they, as they see things, they see the affluent of Martha's Vineyard, many of whom are millionaires and multimillionaires, as being hypocritical because from their point of view, the United States was built on class collaboration between affluent Euro-Americans and not so affluent Euro-Americans who joined hands in order to plunder the indigenous population and enslave the Africans. From the point of view of the GOP base, the affluent of places like Martha's Vineyard have broken with that bargain. And that makes them, in a sense, from their point of view, unpatriotic. It makes it necessary in their point, from their point of view to try to harass these folks, to try to unmask them from their narrow perspective. And I think that that latter point 
actually is the point that's missing in the national discourse on these latest escapades by these Republican governors. You know, that, that's, that's such a critical point. Of course, one of the reasons this being the Black Table on the Black Star Network, we wanted to invite you in was to draw some parallels and help readers who may have seen on social media over the last several cycles, this comparison to the so-called reverse freedom rides of, of 1962. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, thank you for, for kind of sketching out the broad outline. You know, it is intriguing, given the fact that you named Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, the simple, you know, how do you read the fact that these are Venezuelans who are coming from a country that the United States has worked assiduously to undermine in terms of its leadership? I mean, who are these Venezuelans in your sense? And of course, as you said, in Florida, uh, very quickly, DeSantis backed off of the Cuban uh, population. But the Venezuelans, as you said, would, should be upset. I mean, who are these Venezuelans? Are these the folks who supported Nicolas Maduro? Or are these some of the people who are lined up behind Juan Guaido, which, of course, the United States has been trying to, who, the United States has been trying to install for quite some time now? Well, I think it's a broad array uh, mm -hmm. with regard to the Venezuelan population. Certainly, uh, there are counter-revolutionary forces, but oftentimes there are folks who have empty stomachs. There are people who are having difficulties surviving, uh, given the de facto blockade that Washington has placed on this country. Now, if they had talked to me, I would have told them to try to hold on for a bit longer. I say that because you just had the election in neighboring Colombia, which led to a reinvigoration of diplomatic relations between Bogota and Caracas. If things go according to plan, <clears throat> we'll see the re-election, if you'd like, of uh, Lula da Silva and neighboring Brazil, which should bring uh, another a sigh of relief uh, in Caracas and perhaps ease the pain that has been inflicted by the U.S. de facto blockade. But uh, that's easy for me to say, uh, sitting <laughs> in the safety and comfort of Southeast Texas. And I think that uh, as we have seen in Martha's Vineyard, I think our obligation is to try to extend a hand of assistance, to try to provide as best we can uh, some kind of food and shelter, uh, education for the children, it was quite distressing to hear about a suicide of one of these migrants in New York City uh, just the other day. Uh, that bespeaks the kind of pressure they're being subjected to. And it also bespeaks the cruelty mm -hmm. that is being inflicted upon them. You know that that uh, staff writer for The Atlantic, I think his name is Adam Server, wrote a book with regard to the Trumpistas suggesting, quote, that the cruelty is the point. Yes. And I think that he has a point. Yes, because I do think that in the Trump base, uh, the idea of inflicting cruelty upon uh, migrants, upon people not from the United States, it resonates deeply. It resonates with the history of this country. Absolutely. And we would be remiss if we fail to point that out. Now, with regard to the so-called reverse uh, freedom rides, mm -hmm. I was just, just writing something about that the other day, uh, mm -hmm. because you may recall Leander Perez of Plaquemine Parish, Louisiana. Yes. Uh, of all of the troglodytes in Dixie, uh, he could easily compete as troglodyte number one. <laughs> and he, from Louisiana, was involved in this noxious adventure of trying to send black people north because uh, his estimation was, well, you people in the north, you're so sympathetic to black people, you take them. And <laughs> Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, who, as you know, for decades was one of the most powerful forces in, on Capitol Hill, uh, was supporting him. And uh, I think that that should remind all of us that today the victims may be those from Venezuela, but tomorrow, particularly given this rise of neo-fascism, it's not beyond the realm of imagination. Uh, that black people, again, could be in the crosshairs for being uh, shipped across the country like so many cattle. 
Wow, that's uh, and 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 this is something we're definitely going to get into. One of one of his lieutenants, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, George Singleman, one of the architects there of these reverse freedom rides. As you say, the the push factors drawing those those desperate people of African descent, poor people, out of the South, out of Texas and Louisiana and Alabama and other places in the 1960s. I guess, as you say, you make a, a parallel between those who are not able to hold on in places like Venezuela and other places. But, you know, we, we're coming up on a break, but I can't resist the urge to ask you. Uh, I've heard you talk a lot across a number of different platforms about what you see emerging as a possible um, event horizon in terms of multipolar uh, multipolar world emerging in this unique moment in history. And he's like, say, if they could have just held on, you know, <laughs> comes back. I mean, you know, I mean, do you really think we are on the verge of something we haven't seen in recent memory in terms of world politics? Oh, I think so. I guess I should give a brief response since we're on the cusp of a break. And yeah, we can come back on the other side. In fact, you know what? Why don't we take a pause when we come back? That'll mm. give you pl pl plenty of time to stretch out. That'll give us, mm. a, I'm sure there's some uh, royal funeral watchers who want to know what place England plays in this new multipolar world or mm. not. So we come mm -hmm. back. So why don't we take a pause now, uh, Prof? And when we come back on the other side uh, here at the Black Table, we will continue our conversation with Professor Gerald Horn. And we are glad that you all are here. This, this man is an international treasure. And we're glad that the Black Star Network has been able to prevail upon him for some of his time as we continue in our work. So we'll be back in a moment. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Greg Carr here, your host with Professor Gerald Horn. And when we left, uh, Gerald, uh, that asked you a question uh, about what you see merging in terms of international politics and how even this question of migration crises and others fit in this larger, uh, larger scheme of things. But let me get out of your way. You are about to give us your sense of really what's going on in terms of these shifts we're seeing around the world. Well, these global shifts do not take place frequently. If you look at my book on the 16th century, I wrote at length about how and why it was that this minor monarchy on the fringes of Europe, speaking of England yeah, in the 1500s, was able to surge forth, not least by doing an in run around the religious conflicts that were bedeviling its competitors, speaking of his Catholic majesty in Spain, speaking of the caliph in Turkey, uh, Ottoman Turkey, a predominantly Muslim country. And they flipped the script by moving towards race as a marker for settlements and as a marker for enslavement as well, uh, to the point where I opened the book by quoting uh, Andrew Young, the former chief aide to Martin Luther King, former mayor of Atlanta, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, who argued in the 1970s that it was London that actually invented racism. Now, there are some who suggested that that's a bridge too far, but it gives you an idea of why and how it, is, how it was that so many people of African descent wound up in North America speaking English, this language of Northwestern Europe. <laughs> there are signs that are rampant, suggesting that we are on the verge of another shift. You saw it in the meeting in Central Asia just a few days ago of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, as the title suggests, led by the People's Republic of China, which by uh, many measures uh, has a larger economy than that of the United States of America. And you see uh, other nations uh, banging on the door trying to gain admission to the SCO or trying to gain admission to the allied organization 
uh, speaking of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the Financial Times of London reported just a day or two ago that as we speak, China supplies more capital to developing countries than the International Monetary Fund headquartered in Washington or the World Bank headquartered in Washington. And that's not taking into account uh, its allies and, and comrades. So there is a distinct possibility that we are on the verge of a global shift. And if that takes place, I'm sure those with as much gray hair as I now have will recall what happened a half century ago when the United States set this process in motion when they cut a deal with China against the interests of the then Soviet Union, which led to massive foreign direct investment into China, which has created this juggernaut. And as I point out in the 16th century book and on other platforms, it's striking to note that Protestant London basically cut a deal against the interests of its fellow Christians, speaking of Catholic Spain, mm -hmm. by making an alliance with what was thought to be the antagonist of the Christians, speaking of the Muslim population, not only in Turkey, but of course, uh, populating heavily North Africa, particularly Algeria. So we are living in important times, we're living in profound times, and it's well past time uh, for our organizations and leaders to come up to speed so that they can more adequately and effectively direct our besieged community. Excellent. So now that you've given us the, the, the big picture, the global picture, and you sketched out early in the first block, kind of some of the hemispheric concerns, we can, I guess, in, in our rhythm, come back into this hemisphere thinking now about uh, what's going on in Haiti and certainly some of the early recent pronouncements in the Dominican Republic asking for the United States to basically come in and mm -hmm. either declare Haiti a protectorate or something, you know, and thinking about Latin America and Central America. And as you said, those of us with enough gray hair to remember how the United States worked uh, again, assiduously against left governments in, in, in Latin America, the Caribbean and, and in Central America this time around, do you think that the U.S. And, and its coalition partners have that kind of muscle? Because it does seem to be that this move left in Latin America may free up those countries in ways and in the Caribbean, perhaps in ways. Certainly Mia Moore Motley, who has been making a lot of noise and CARICOM has made a lot of noise about coalition politics with African countries. Um, the, the, the folks who are finding their way to the Texas border, um, the places they're coming from, do you anticipate uh, some shifts in those countries, in, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in Central America? And if so, what, what might that look like? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we will get a glimpse of what's to come with regard to these upcoming Brazilian elections, where the incumbent uh, Bolsonaro is pledging to do a Trump. Uh, that is to say, the result of the election will show either that he won or he was cheated. He has close ties to the military. There's a real danger and fear that he may do successfully what Trump did ineffectively, that is to say, pull off a coup and remain in power and retain power. If so, that would be terrible news for any prospect of change in this hemisphere because uh, Brazil fundamentally borders every nation in South America and therefore can extend its tentacles uh, far and wide. Uh, with regard to Haiti, uh, that's a special case because we all know that uh, Haiti pulled off one of the most extraordinary events in the history of the world, that is to say, a successful revolt by unpaid workers, otherwise known as slaves, between 1791 and 1804, and then leading a global crusade against slavery, not least in North America, attracting many Black people from North America to their shores, but they have been punished and pulverized ever since, uh, up to and including a U.S. occupation between 1915 and 1934, uh, up to and including the destabilization of President Aristide, uh, who was president just uh, a few years ago, or perhaps a few decades ago. And so when the president of the neighboring Dominican Republic uh, suggests that there should be some sort of joint military intervention uh, in Haiti. I'm afraid to say that we've seen this movie before yes. and it did not work out very well, not least for the Haitians. So we should be on our guard. Uh, we should be 
alerting our friends in the Congressional Black Caucus that uh, they need to be on their guard, uh, that they need to be developing uh, programs to help to rescue uh, Haiti from this valley into which it has fallen, uh, because we all know that part of the migration crisis that's now unfolding also includes uh, Haitians trying to get to the Bahamas and then from the Bahamas to South Florida, uh, many of them drowning in the choppy seas uh, to the extent that black Americans are silent about this tragedy. We're engaging fundamentally in a self indictment. Yes. Yes. And then it really is disheartening to see some of the policy statements or policy positions rather that certain members of the Congressional Black Caucus have taken in the last several months. Um, not only maybe with regard to Haiti and U.S. Uh, foreign policy from the administration, but with regard to the Ukraine war, I'm thinking about Gregory Meeks, of course, and perhaps in trying to get African countries to pick a side and decide with the United States. But, you know, history moves on. Sometimes policymakers have to catch up or, or not, so to speak. But, uh, but you know, it, let's think about this. And, of course, well, the reason we asked you to join us today You've mentioned, you say you're writing about it, the reverse freedom rides. Um, of course, the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, was uh, deputized as a sort of border czar, I suppose, of sorts. And the governor there in Texas, Greg Abbott, sends some of the folks who have crossed the border to her house, to the Naval Observatory, which I was over the other day watching everybody lined up in front of the British embassy to sign the guest book. And of course, that's right there in the same neighborhood across the street from the South African embassy, of course where uh, Kamala Harris lives, and uh, these folks were dropped off there. And of course, as we'll talk about uh, in, in our next block, as we walk through the history of the reverse freedom rides, uh, we saw folks dropped off by the governor of Florida. Well, I guess he went into Texas. They claim nobody knew that he was coming, his people, as you say, in, 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 in uh, Martha's Vineyard. What do you make of this... Uh, this attempt by Abbott to literally drop these folks off at the door of the sitting vice president of the United States. What was that about? Well, first of all, he's in a tough reelection race with Beto O'Rourke. A poll suggests that he's ahead in, by double digits, excuse me, single digits, single mm -hmm. digits, excuse me. And for a Republican in Texas, that's not good news since they controlled the levers of power across the board for about three decades now. And so he wants to stir up his base. Uh, Vice President Harris is not, shall we say, a popular figure <laughs> in, um, amongst his base. In fact, uh, they despise her. And once again, uh, he's playing on that contradiction whereby people in the base of the Republican Party feel that if you look at the history of this country, there was collaboration between and amongst elites on the one hand and common ordinary Euro-American working class people and poor people on the other hand. Now we were able to disrupt that bargain in the 1960s. And actually the book that I'm writing about concerns Washington DC because what we should not forget was that Washington DC where you're now sitting was a critical and crucial theater, not least because at the same time that these so-called reverse freedom riots were taking place, you had African nations opening embassies and legations and chanceries in Washington, DC. Oftentimes they were being harassed by the metropolitan police of Washington, harassed by their neighbors and these affluent Northwest Washington neighborhoods. But this was compromising the United States attempt to win over their populaces, to win their hearts and minds, to use the phrase of that era. And so that created enormous pressure on Washington to begin to try to remove the most egregious aspects of Jim Crow so that they could appeal more effectively to these African and Caribbean populations through their diplomats, envoys, and emissaries. But at the same time, uh, this had obvious uh, benefit for the resident so-called U.S. Negro community. <laughs> As I've mentioned before, Washington tried to do an end run around that contradiction by preparing buttons to be placed on the lapel 
circles of African and Caribbean diplomats so that they could enjoy restaurants and hotels and the like. But the rather genius, slick, uh, Black American students, such as at Howard University, yes, they could manufacture the <laughs> <laughs> could speak with a phony accent, sure. and gain access uh, to these restaurants and accommodations. So the whole plan uh, fell apart, and so Washington was dragged kicking and screaming into this new era of anti Jim Crow, and this was not well understood by the Dixiecrats, for example. Leander Perez and Russell Long, the senator from Louisiana, who then began to launch these reverse freedom rides to further embarrass the national government, because of course they despised the federal government in Washington in any case, because the federal government had prosecuted the Civil War, expropriated their enslaved property in the millions, if not billions, without compensation, uh, leaving formerly affluent families poverty stricken. Yes. So uh, the point that I'm trying to make ultimately is that Black Americans have a stake with regard in, in this immigration crisis and this migration crisis, because not so long ago, we were the props who were being used to embarrass the federal government. And I'm afraid to say the way politics are going in this country uh, with the rise of neo-fascism is not beyond the realm of imagination that we may become props again. That's true. Well, let's pick up with uh, that on the other side of the break, Gerald. You've gotten us into the 1960s, right into the bullseye of the, the context for the reverse freedom rides. And so when we come back in a moment with Professor Horn, we're going to continue this conversation and really dig into what the reverse freedom rides were, what were the objectives, uh, how did they succeed, how did they fail, and what did they reveal? about the nature of African experiences here in the United States and the political context in which we've engaged in our fight. So we'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood-Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support the Black Star Network across all of its streaming platforms and make sure you subscribe and download the Black Star app. So, Gerald, when we uh, left, you were you had led us right into the 1960s. You know, it reminds me of our friends, uh, our, our comrades in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and how Charlie Cobb tells that story, how they went in Atlanta and Ogingo Dinga was there. And they trying to convince him that it isn't so bad down here in the South. And so the young people met with him like, man, you don't understand what's going on here. And then, of course, they made that famous song that if memory serves me correctly, they performed actually when Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer were in New York, which led Malcolm to talk about geopolitics, as you say, in terms of this relationship where they say Ogingo Dinga, which, of course, never happened in the way it did, as they say in the song. But Ogingo was like. If you white folks don't straighten up, I'm going to call Yomo Kenyatta. And <laughs> I thought about it because my Kenyan friends were wondering whether Kenyatta or uh, Raila Oginga, who, or whether Raila Oginga or the new president of Kenya would attend, attend the Queen's funeral. And I don't remember which one went. But of course, both of these uh, sons of anti colonial Africans who are caught up in that moment that, that you're writing about now. Um, 
let, let, let's talk. Let's talk about those reverse freedom rides. I mean, of course, the same student nonviolent coordinating committee and their comrades in core uh, have the freedom rides, which uh, some of the reverse freedom rides folks, the White Citizens Council and others, claim uh, that they are doing in reverse. So, uh, what were the reverse freedom rides? You begun to, to trace it out for us, but um. We know in the spring of 1962, they start doing what exactly? The, these racists in the South. Inveigling and inducing black Americans to get on transport to send them, for example, to Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts, to the Hyannisport home of then U.S. President uh, John F. Kennedy. You asked uh, what did they expose? And I think it, it exposed a much deeper vein in the body politic of the United States of America. That is to say that uh, close or even not so close students of U.S. history should probably know that the presence on these shores of people of African descent has been a contested phenomenon. That is to say, on the one hand, obviously, uh, our free labor was desirable to some, but if you look at the history of the state of Georgia, for example, when it was established against the interests of the indigenous population in 1733, the idea was for Georgia to be a so-called all-white colony, so-called. But it didn't work out, obviously, since per the 2010 census, uh, Georgia had the largest black population in the United States of America. Today, the 2020 census says that it's Texas. But I think that that episode, if you begin to trace it, you can then trace it to the American Colonization Society, which in the 19th century began to try to deport uh, free Negroes uh, to Liberia. That's the origins of that uh, West African uh, state. Uh, many free Negroes, of course, wound up in Sierra Leone, a neighbor uh, of Liberia. And then when you get to the U.S. Civil War, the sainted and vaunted uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, had a series of negotiations with various states trying to find a landing place for the newly emancipated Africans. Uh, there was a serious attempt to send our ancestors to Brazil. I talk about it in that book, in the book I wrote, The Deeper South on the United States and Brazil. Uh, there were attempts to send uh, our ancestors to the Dominican Republic, and that barely failed. Uh, otherwise, many of us would not be sitting here. <laughs> and then post-Civil War, you had uh, Senator Morgan of Alabama, who had the idea of sending uh, free black people to the Congo uh, after King Leopold uh, took over that sprawling territory in West Central Africa, which by some measures is larger than Western Europe. Uh, he began dickering with uh, Brussels to dispatch us all there. So this idea of reverse freedom rides uh, had a lengthy genealogy and uh, it didn't pan out for various reasons, not least because those who the Dixiecrats were seeking to victimize had federal power at their disposal. Just like today, even though I'm not sure how serious this idea is, of bringing criminal charges for human trafficking against Governor DeSantis uh, of Florida, uh, certainly that should cause him to divert some of his resources for reelection to hiring more lawyers to at least investigate the prospect. So uh, once again, I, I think that it's very important, it's incumbent indeed for our organizations, for our leaders, for our intellectuals to keep a close eye upon this tragedy that's unfolding in Martha's Vineyard and other sites, uh, because who is to say that we will not become the next victims given the lengthy history of, of trying to send us to various climes as if we're pawns on a chessboard. Absolutely, Joe, and it is, really is striking, isn't it, brother? Because this is, our, this is in our living memory. I mean, you mentioned Russell B. Long, and he had, and of course, it didn't get anywhere, but he did propose it. I think it was 1962, the same year as they did the reverse freedom rides. 
he proposes putting legislation on the floor in the U.S. Senate to send us, quote unquote, back to Africa. <laughs> and this is in our living memory. <laughs> and so um, and, and as you talk about these push and pull factors, you, you started, of course, in the first block talking about these kind of intra-racial class issues in, in white communities in the United States. In the black community with the reverse freedom rights, even as they call themselves trying to make a point, there are some pull factors as well, like the immigrants you uh, have already discussed coming from Central America and other places. There in Latin America, there are people, poor black people, uh, leaving the South in 19, but in the 1960s, early 1960s, to the rate of what, around 400 people a day, maybe 150,000 people a year by the first half of the 1960s. And some of these folks who get on these rides are induced these reverse freedom rides are induced in the same way, as you say, these folks in San Antonio, and there seems to be a local sheriff who's already started to say he's going to investigate what did you promise these people jobs? Did you, well, they absolutely, as we know, in the reverse freedom rides in places like New Orleans, they put ads in the paper. We'll give you money. We'll give you a free ticket. And there's a job or job training waiting for you on the other side, uh, which and then they try to induce the NAACP and the Urban League to help them. These racists say, well, we, so I mean, how do you interpret the pull factors, both on those who who participated in the reverse freedom rides then, and how does that compare to the immigrants now who are saying, hey, I have nothing to lose? Well, you know, it's very interesting. You know that Charles Blow, the black columnist for the New York Times, uh, he's been on the soapbox lately, uh, clamoring for a so-called reverse migration, suggesting that black he's moved to Atlanta, for example. Yes. He thinks that uh, black people should be moving uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line for various reasons that we need not go into here. Well, did, did, he, did he read Behold the Land? Perhaps he read Behold the Land, Gerald. <laughs> he's thinking about, he's channeling his inner due voice. <laughs> <But go ahead. laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I don't dismiss that altogether. I mean, I if you have a, a job opportunity in Atlanta, why turn it down if, if you're right. living in Manhattan? Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that there is a reason why uh, over the decades there has been an influx north of the Mason-Dixon line into places like Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland from Alabama and Mississippi. <laughs> You know, I grew up in St. Louis and my parents uh, were born and raised in Mississippi. I grew up on a steady diet of horror stories about Mississippi. One of my mother's favorite sayings was, don't tell me nothing about Mississippi. <laughs> I've been reading your sister's book about y'all's mom. No question. <laughs> you got yeah, so, I mean, there, there, there's a reason for that. I mean, I still yeah. have burned into my memory mm. the idea that uh, you had to step off the sidewalk if they were coming towards you on the sidewalk in Mississippi, that uh, you could be executed if you looked the person in the eye when you were talking to them. You were supposed to look down or look away. Yes. And so uh, this is a very complicated question. And as I've tried to stress, uh, I'm not sure if it's all behind us. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the points I've been st stressing in my work is that there was a very unique and peculiar confluence that led to the erosion of Jim Crow in the 1950s and the 1960s, not least that international pressure that I was just sketching a moment or two ago. But I think that some of our leaders and organizations felt that there was a final settlement of what used to be called the Negro question, but actually there was just a truce. And mm -hmm. with regard to a truce, uh, any party on either side of the equation can decide to move away from that truth if they feel that the underlying conditions that gave rise to it are no longer obtained. Mm -hmm. And I think that the latter point is a fair assessment of the thinking of the Trumpistas and our political opponents. Uh, that's why we have to be on guard. Uh, that's why we should see coming to the defense of these migrants in Martha's Vineyard as a kind of firewall. Uh, that is to say, uh, aiding them ultimately is aiding ourselves. That's a perfect place for us to pause and we'll go when we come back to the future and actually the present, how we can learn from this so-called immigrant crisis, which is being fomented, of course, by those who have different political uh, objectives than we do, and try to see how we and what we should be doing to, um, to address this situation. So back in a moment. When we 
invest in ourselves. We're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing. Creating. Making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are black beyond measure. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to support the Black Star Network, download the app, subscribe, and follow our shows across all streaming platforms. Uh, we're wrapping up today with Professor Gerald Horn, who has given us a global and a local and historical perspective on this uh, ginned up immigrant crisis. And we've used the so-called reverse freedom rides as a point of entry to think about how black folk here in the United States should really be thinking about and acting on uh, addressing this question of migration and, and crisis. Um, Gerald, yeah, it's fascinating to hear that one of the one of your recent one of your current projects is talking about Washington D.C. and this kind of this kind of center of uh, not only the current fracturing world system, but you know how that connects directly to these reverse freedom rides and the implications for them. One of the things that emerged in the reverse freedom rides is this uh, assertion that there was surplus black labor mm -hmm. in the South. The idea that there was, you know, mechaniza mechanization, uh, that there were subsidies to kind of put a cap on cotton production and other things. And folks were leaving mm -hmm. in part because it, they wanted to drive them out of the South. I'm wondering what you think about the nature of immigration and migration as it relates to the shifting economies of the hemisphere and of this country. And as black folk, what should we be thinking about in terms of the just not only the economy, but our place in it? And how should we be thinking about folks who are coming here? Because we, we both heard uh, black folks say, well, I have no sympathy for these immigrants. They're taking our jobs and I mean, it seems to me that's very deeply flawed thinking, but could you help us understand that so we're not necessarily so hostile toward these folks who are coming here? Well, first of all, with regard to the hemisphere, um, as noted, one of the reasons, one of the uh, pull factors, or push factors, I should say, driving people from Nicaragua and Venezuela and Havana in particular, uh, is the U.S. campaign crusade against these governments. That is to say, if a government arises that seems to want to redistribute the wealth from top to bottom, the United States goes into overdrive and in trying to destabilize those governments. Of course, those regimes that are interested in destabilizing wealth from bottom to top basically get a pass. But of course, that doesn't mean that the poor people get a pass because oftentimes they feel compelled to leave their homelands too. Uh, because uh, of poverty. Uh, with regard to changes in the economy, uh, as we speak, uh, you have the rise of artificial intelligence. You see it at the checkout counters of drugstores and grocery stores, whereas you once dealt with a human being and now you deal with some mechanical contraption. That's right. We've been promised that just around the corner are driverless vehicles, uh, which should cut a prodigious swath through Uber and Lyft drivers, not to mention through uh, truck drivers. 
there are, of course, specialists who disagree with that analysis, but we shall see, and certainly we should not be surprised if the ranks of the employed, particularly in our community, uh, begin to decline, uh, which would then lead to rising unemployment uh, with the prospect of Trumpistas returning to power uh, in November of 2024, if not before. Uh, with regard to the present moment, uh, I've noticed that LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, yes. has been on the case in Martha's Vineyard in particular. Uh, I would like to see them joined by the NAACP. I have no reason to think that that's not happening. And indeed, just like I would like to see a further collaboration between the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and its peer, its counterpart, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, because obviously the issues are parallel, uh, the issues are in common, and I'm not sure if we have enough strength on our own uh, to go it alone, uh, certainly domestically, and definitely not, we need uh, international support as well, and I would imagine through MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, we could be reaching out to our friends in Mexico City who over the decades have been very helpful uh, to our struggle, uh, going back at least to the struggles of black heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson at the turn of the 20th century, uh, who received uh, succor and support uh, from friends in Mexico City. So uh, I don't think that there is a deficit in terms of trying to discern what is to be done. The only problem might be political will. And there it is, political will. And thinking about the crisis in Jackson, the crisis in Flint, um, the ability of local lawmakers, state-based lawmakers to strangle uh, these places in part because they come off as blaming this on mismanagement when in fact they sound almost like some of these moderate uh, quote unquote, moderate white, relatively speaking, moderate white policymakers in the 60s who, when the White Citizens Council approached them to fund the reverse freedom rides in places like Arkansas and Louisiana, they balked because, as you said, they did not want to further exacerbate uh, the either, either relationship with these emerging non-white nations, certainly the African nations, and they didn't want to be painted as racist. But they seem to be terribly effective when they appear to be more moderate, when in fact we know they're not. So I guess in, in, in the moments that we have before we, we wrap, uh, I'm wondering if you might take a stab with your lawyer hat on to, to speculate a little for us. Could DeSantis be in trouble here, inducing folk onto a plane in San, in San Antonio, a quick stop in Florida, and then maybe another one before you end up in uh, in Cape Cod? You know, is this a matter of will too? I mean, if you put the case together, shouldn't this be kind of open and shut, or what do you think? Well, I think it should be, but if you're asking me if Governor DeSantis will be indicted. Rel relatively soon, I would probably answer no. no, because what's happened is not only the stacking of the courts by Mr. Trump and his predecessor, George W. Bush, but perhaps even more important and more crucial is the ideological shift on the bench, uh, where even incoming uh, Justice uh, Brown Jackson, if I'm not yes. mistaken, has conceded during her confirmation hearings that she too was an originalist. Uh, that is to say, this uh, cockamamie idea that you should interpret the Constitution based upon formulations in the 1780s by 55 men of property, a disproportionate percentage were slave owners, needless to say. Uh, and that originalist doctrine helps to bake into the cake of contemporary judicial thinking, a kind of conservatism that even liberals, because of the correlation of forces, feel constrained to bow down to. Mm -hmm. So given all of that, uh, I think in a just world, that is to say in a 1968 world, when we were creeping towards justice, I think that there would be an open and shut case 
against Governor DeSantis. But in 2022, I'm not so certain. But that's that's chilling because we, as we as we all know, if there's no rule of there's no rule of law, there's no enforceability. And they do seem to have retreated from the will to enforce the law. Um, we're deeply grateful, uh, Gerald, that you spent this hour with us here at the table. And this really allows us to have a starting point to think through some of the things that are occurring and equally important to act as a result of having a, a little bit more information and, and perspective. So thank you again, brother. Thank you for inviting me. Always, always. So we'll return in a moment to clear the table and prepare for our next session here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. In the spring of 1962, somewhere around 200 people of African descent were put on buses in places like Louisiana and Arkansas and Alabama and shipped to places like Detroit and Los Angeles and almost half of those folk to Hyannisport in Massachusetts to the Kennedy compound, vacation compound in something called the reverse freedom rides. The goal to embarrass Northern liberals and to somehow act as if uh, the folk in the South were acting in the best interests of these poor black folk who needed a, a fresh start on life. Here we are in 2022 and we see the governors of Texas and Arizona and Florida sending folks who are coming to the United States, having been pushed out of their countries in part because of the actions of the United States government, sending them to the residents of the vice president of the United States here in Washington, D.C., to Martha's Vineyard off Cape Cod, and the speculation ensues, perhaps even to the home state of the president of the United States in Delaware. The parallels are very striking, and, and Gerald Horn has helped us not only see those parallels, but to interpret them. The question that Gerald left us with, the question that Professor Horn leaves us with always is, do we have the will? Do we have the will to stand on the right side of history and come together in all of our coalition and all of the power that we have when we come together to intervene on behalf of our common humanity and stop this rising neo-fascism. This time will tell. So we're glad to have you here at the Black Table. Remember to subscribe to the Black Star Network, download the app, and we look forward to seeing you next week with another conversation here at the Black Table. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. When you talk about Blackness and what happens in Black culture, we're about covering these things 
and matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it. And you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 